So in this video, we're going to be talking about counting outcomes in the context of probability. So in a previous video, I talked about one method you can use for this, which is an ordered list or a tree diagram, and they're actually essentially the same thing. Both of these methods are great for listing your sample space, for figuring out everything that could happen. It describes each of these complex events um, very well. The downside to them is they're a lot of work. And in the context of a lot of problems, I don't necessarily need a list of all the outcomes. That's not to say you can't use the tree diagrams or the ordered list in these problems, just sometimes it's not the most efficient method. It is a nice fallback though if you get into a problem and just completely blank on what to do. So the first thing that we're going to use is called the multiplication rule. It's named because I'm just multiplying stuff together. So if I have a situation where I've got a certain number of options for my first choice, a certain number of options for my second choice, a certain number of options for my third choice, so on and so forth, I just multiply those options together. So for example, tomorrow's trattoria gives you the choice of three pasta shapes and five sauces. Now I could go through and do an ordered list or a tree diagram and list. I have spaghetti with marinara, spaghetti with bolognese, spaghetti with alfredo, so on and so forth. And I'd end up with 15 possible um, dishes that I could order. Or I could multiply my three pasta shapes times my five sauces. The one thing you want to be careful of is in these examples when I'm using the multiplication rule, my number of options for my second choice didn't change depending on my choice for the first one. Now if it's the same number and the different options, I don't care. But if that number changes for that second choice or for that third choice based on what's already happened, I can't use the multiplication rule. I may need to step back to a tree diagram. So another example, Daft Punk, and I know by putting them in here, I'm probably dating this. It's probably already dated by the time I record this, but hey, let's go with it. They're known for wearing helmets in their performances. They like to be anonymous. So let's say they have five different helmets, four different suits, six different pairs of shoes. How many different outfits can they put together? Well, I'm going to have five options for my first choice, four for my second, six for my third. Now bear in mind, this is multiplication. I can do this in any order I want to. So if I did the shoes first, it wouldn't affect anything. So let's say you added the option of with or without a hat. I'd love to see them in hats. With or without a synthesizer, with or without an ascot, why not? Well, then we add a few more options. We've got with or without is always two options. A lot of probability techs, a lot of probability teachers, they like these options because it kind of forces you to think a little bit about the problem. So remember, with or without, that's two options. They may word it differently, but do watch for those. Next, I'm going to introduce a symbol. This is the factorial symbol. It's an exclamation. A lot of your scientific calculators, graphing calculators will have this option built into it. But you have to be careful because it's easy to go into scientific notation. Um, my TI-83, for instance, goes into scientific notation around 13 factorial, at which point my calculator's rounding. So that's a bad thing. So knowing the definition is useful. It's best defined through these examples. So for instance, 6 factorial is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 3 factorial, 3 times 2 times 1. I'm just multiplying the number that I have there times each of the whole numbers less than it. Some special cases, one factorial makes sense to me as just being one. Zero factorial though, this is a practical thing. Sometimes zero factorial will come up in my equations and I don't want it to turn everything to zero. So it is defined to be one this is just a special case. Someone came down from on high and said, you know what, it makes my life easier if zero factorial equals one. There's not really a good logical reason for it beyond it makes the problems give you the right answer. All right, a permutation. This is a special type of thing. This is a, I have a certain number of items and from those items, I'm gonna select a subset of them and I care what order I pick them in. Our notation for this is NPR. 
N is my number of items that I can choose from, and R is how many items I choose, and it's defined to be N factorial over N minus R factorial. The important thing to remember about permutation is I can only choose an item once, so once it's chosen I can't choose, choose it again, and order matters. So those are two very important things about it. We're going to talk about combinations in a minute where order doesn't matter. You can think about permutation as the multiplication rule though. So again, if you're on a test and you just completely forget everything, you can step back. As long as you remember that permutation means I'm choosing from a certain number of items this many. So if you imagine, let's say, a, a marathon and there are five people in the race. And of those five people, I want to know how many different ways can I get first and second place. Well, I have five choices when the race starts for first place. Depending on who gets first place, then I have four options for my second choice. So I have five times four possible outcomes. That also works out at the end of your permutation calculations using the NPR from the previous slide. You know, you'll end up with 5 times 4 at the very end. And CR combinations, again, I have a certain number of items I'm choosing from. Once you're chosen, you can't be chosen again. But in this case, order doesn't matter. So I don't care who came in first, who came in second. One thing to look for when in solving problems like this is one, they may tell you order matters, but a lot of times they'll give you a story where order is implied. So for instance, anytime you have some sort of a competition, order is implied. I care if I get first place or third place. I care if I get the gold medal versus the bronze medal. That's a different experience for me. I care if the first person chosen is president, the second person chosen is vice president, the third person chosen is secretary. So those are permutations. If I'm choosing five people out of a group of 20 to serve on a committee, or if I'm choosing 12 jurors out of a pool of 100, don't really care about order. So those are going to be combinations. So look for that implied order in problems as well as when they say very explicitly order matters. Again, this can be brought back to the multiplication rule. There's a little bit of a twist here. So, again, with the five items to choose from, and I choose two, I have five choices for the first option and four choices for the second option. So I have 20 total outcomes. But choosing option A, then B, is the same as B and then A. So I've got these groups of two that are the same thing. So I have two factorial things that could happen. If I had groups of three, A, B, and C would be the same as A, C, and B, B, C, and A, B, A, C. There's six total things, so I'm going to take my however many items I got and divide it by six. It's these six things are the same thing, so I'm only going to count them once. So some examples. I've got 12 people chosen to serve on a jury from a pool of 20. How many different ways can they be called? Well, here, I don't care about order. If I'm juror number five or juror number seven, I'm still on jury duty, so it doesn't really matter. So this is going to be a combination, 20C12. If I choose three people at random from a class of 20, the first student will receive five extra credit points on their next test. The second student will be given a new bike, and the third will lose five points off their next test and have to pay for a new bike. You care whether you're chosen first or third. Very different experience. So here I have a permutation. I care about order. So some mixed examples. Passwords can be made up of letters. I actually kind of like this example because it explains to me why I keep having to change my password and why it has all these rules. So you can think about this. I've got how many four character passwords can you make if you only use lowercase letters? So I've got 26 options for my first choice. 
because I can reuse the same letter, so my password in theory could be A, 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 A. That's a legitimate outcome. So I've got 26 options for that second one. Here, because I'm replacing, because I'm reusing letters, or I could at least, not a permutation, not a combination. This is going to be the basic multiplication rule. 26 times 26 times 26 times 26. If you add letters or digits, so again, lowercase letters or digits, so 0 through 9. Well, now I have 36 options, so 36 times 36 times 36 times 36. If you included the 29 special characters, exclamation point, at, pound sign, dollar sign, and so forth, this number gets really huge, and this makes it harder for someone to go through and go, and go okay, I think their password is AAAA. Okay, I think it's AAAB, which sounds very tedious as a human, but if you ask a computer to do it, it can go through all those possible passwords very quickly. When you get up to the point where you've got an eight character password that could have letters, numbers, special characters, doesn't include any words because that's a much smaller group, your password becomes virtually unhackable, even with um, supercomputers trying to do every possible password.